Is it Alexi, Alexis, Luz, Luzelovic? <laughs> it's Alexi, and that's the easy one. Good. The S is just a graphic addition, but it's Alexi, like Alexei in Russian, but it's Alexi. Uh, the issue of Luzelovic versus Luz, that's an interesting issue. Yeah, my family name is Luzelovic, which is a Romanian name. But when I, I did begin to publish in France 30-35 years ago, uh, how do you pronounce that? I mean, it's like French people are, when a name is longer than, than two syllables, they, they really are encountered some difficulties, you know, to just to make a sense out of a name longer than two or three syllables. Mm. And it was upsetting because it was really giving me, you know, this position as a foreign comes from the other side of the board. So I decided uh, to to just keep the first year of the news. Okay. That's a pen name. That's a pen name and uh, I wasn't betraying in my family name since the first year of and uh, because for me that was very important not to betray. And uh, and then it's also I mean it's semantic. It's very rich news. Great spirit, yes. right? Okay. Narrow man is a miracle for the philosophers. <laughs> well, <laughs> Alexei, what's your current position? Well, I'm chair of modern cultural studies at the School of European Studies at Cardiff University since 2007. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, you were 20 years uh, in Quebec, yeah. Montreal. Uh, Université de Montréal, mm. uh, where I was a uh, full professor at the Département de Linguistique et de Traduction. Okay, so the relation with translation studies, cultural Quebec, or was earlier on? No, no, I mean, that when, I, when I was in, in Paris, uh, I mean, I, I, I found it, I was founding myself my PhD studies by being a translator uh, mm. from, uh, from various languages. And uh, so there was a kind of you know, practical interest for that. And, uh, and then when I, I began my academic career in, in Quebec, that was the glorious time where translation studies mm -hmm. were, were born, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a, a wonderful opportunity. But your training is more in philosophy. Uh, literature. Yes. 19th century French literature. Yeah. But I mean, I think we, I mean, it was the same period of time in Paris, and you know, the boundary between philosophy and literature were blurred, so yeah, it's from 19th century French literature, but uh, with yeah, major impact from what was going on in Paris in the 80s. Perhaps you can tell us about what you're doing or what you've done recently uh, what I'm in relation to translation studies, I think. What, oh. what I'm really working on right now in Cardiff is because the uh, chair of modern cultural studies, the question was, is there a human culture? European culture. A European culture, yeah. you know, in the single. You know, is there a European culture? I mean, it was kind of obvious in the 18th century, 19th century less, but uh, 17th century, 18th century, it, it, yeah, it was obvious. I mean, I mean, Mozart was, was just traveling from one European city to another one. When you open Mozart's correspondence, it's just fascinating, is writing in four languages. And switching from, 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 from German to Italian to French, uh, quoting Latin, which means that the people receiving the letters were, mm -hmm. <laughs> like him, familiar with those languages. So, I, yeah, I mean, there was, the 18th century, a European culture. And then, because of history, it became less and less obvious. But now we have a political body called the European Union. But do we have? The European culture. Uh, usually, I, I tell students that uh, for centuries Europe has a spirit without a body. Now we have a body, but where is the spirit? So when I, I, I started to work on, on, on the issue of European culture, after my three books on métissage, cross-cultural encounters, uh, I discovered that the only way to think about a European culture. Well, one, through the notion of métissage, but even more important, through translation. I think that European culture is deeply a culture in translation, uh, where some elements 
appear somewhere in one European culture and then are translated all over Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of modern democracy was born, as we know, in France in the century and then translated in other countries. Uh, an aesthetic idea like uh, a cathedral was born in Italy and then migrated to Spain, to France, to Germany. So a, a German cathedral is a cathedral, a Spanish cathedral is a Spanish but cathedral. It's not limited to Europe. A Mexican cathedral is also. A yeah, but it's true, I mean, but that's part of Europe. I mean, okay. Europe is also beyond, you know, the space of Europe. Uh, and I think that's this kind of displacement cultural displacement are typical of Europe. I mean, let's not forget that I mean, the, the, the founding narrative, you know, I mean, this young princess from Phoenicia being seduced by Zeus, you know, I mean, you know the story, yes. uh, you know, Zeus disguising himself in a white bull, she began to play with him, she climbed on, on his back, too late, he, he's crossing the sea and getting to Crete and then basically raped her. Uh, so that means she's she, 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 she's, not, she's not born in Europe. Uh, coming on the back of Zeus, I assume that she didn't have any kind of uh, legal papers. I mean, she was an illegal immigrant, and uh, being born there, I'm not sure that she was Christian either. You know, I mean, so I think the founding narrative it's about impurity, about displacement, about translation, about translation, translation is displacement. And I think that's really that the only definition I could put forward when I'm thinking about European culture. Uh, so, when uh, at Cardiff University I've been asked to work on what is there a European culture, my only answer is it's a cultural translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the elements are constantly being displaced from one national uh, European culture to another one. And this series of displacement, that's European culture. So yes, uh, it's translation in the broad sense, and that's another issue. So you, you've also set up a, a, an NA program. That's right. Which is on translation in a narrow sense, or so not? Uh, that's, but that's the issue. I think that's the issue. Do we have to really uh, make a distinction between what Michonnet called you know, traduction restreinte and traduction généralisée, or do we have to translate those two notions uh, one into the other one? Yes. And my answer is yes, and I, have to, I, I, I like to play uh, with those two definitions. So yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm personally working on, on the link between uh, translation and European culture, and I'm finishing an essay on the topic. I did create an MA in translation studies, um, and it's quite interesting because I refuse to have a list of languages, you know, I mean, most of academic programs, you, know, you could have a very long list of language sparing. I refused that. I wanted really to be able to have students working with all the languages of the world. So we have translation tutors at Cardiff for European uh, languages and for what I call extra European languages, I'm working with Skype, with video conferences, or with the phone, with the internet. So I'm able to offer the students a translation tutorial in any languages. So we have students from Africa, from the Middle East, from, and from European countries as well. Okay. And Can I, we go back to, before we go into that, I want to go back to when you were 25 or so. Mm. Uh, I'm interested in how you got to where you are now, but when did you start in your mid-twenties? Yeah, mid twenties. It was uh, post May '68. It was post uh, trip to India, and it was pre Mitterrand. Mm -hmm. It was this very interesting period in Paris where ideas were taken seriously, and ideas weren't in kind of uh, good. To make it clear, you're Parisian. You were born in Paris. I was born in Paris. Yes. Technically, I was born in Paris. Yes, well. But you remember this uh, Pierre Goldman book, uh, Juif Colonel né en France? Uh, I think that I'm a Juif Roumain né en France. Okay. You know? uh, what I mean is that, I mean, this first experience growing up in an. I mean, when, when, when your father doesn't a kind of extra knowledge about the city in which one is living, creates a very 
very special situation and uh, there are some silences, there are some uh, unsaid narratives that you have to discover by yourself, mm -hmm. that you have to translate from what is not said. Uh, but I mean, I don't want to go into that direction. Okay, so, okay. The, the, 25. Yeah, so, you know, and when I say three meter on, that was very important. I mean, ideas uh, were taken, you know, for, for, for the value of what they are. That means not abstract speculation, but new readings of history, new reading of the world. I think that what we are witnessing now in Europe is a totally different situation where ideas are just goods. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of us make, you know, academic careers, a very bright academic career, just on some ideas that they could recycle, that they could sell because they know how to sell them. And, and I don't think that uh, ideas are now this permanent reconsideration of what history is about and what the world is about. In the 80s, I, I think in France, in France, that was the last period where, but I mean it was... You know, 80s before power in 1981. And so. 81, yeah, so I, I, I'm very precise in this analysis. I mean, oh. there is really a kind of historical switch. I mean, what happened to the Socialist Party, I think happened to the French Parisian intelligentsia at that time. That is, oh, let's accept reality. Yes. Let's accept reality. For participate. I, I, I went to France in 1981, you see. Here we are. Here we are. And, yes. and I think that uh, let's accept the reality as it is could be very dangerous when uh, you want to express other views of what reality is. Um, mm. That's what translation is about. I mean, a translator knows that uh, a reality could get another name. That means another destiny. Uh, philosophy, and, philosophy and translation, but I mean, yourself, you, you began a chapter in, I can't remember, Companion to Translation Studies, I can't remember which, which uh, publisher of that, anyway. It's about you, is it? Okay, anyway, uh, you, you started by stressing the, uh, the fact that Philosophy and translation are built on the same pattern of thought. And it's true, if we get back to Aristotle's definition of philosophy, uh, you know, you're a philosopher if you're just surprised by the reality. You don't take reality as granted, you know. Maybe there is another naming for reality. Maybe there is even another reality. That was translated stuff. What's really, I mean, translation is this incredible knowledge that uh, uh, Ciel is not exactly heaven or sky, it's not Himmel, it's not Ashamayim, it's you know, I mean, it's, and that's, that's what philosophy is about. Uh, and at that time, I think that to play with ideas like that, I mean, it was still possible. I don't think it's possible anymore. And I think that translation studies were born at that period because of that. Because of that. What should we be doing now? This is addressed to young people starting a doctoral project. What should we be doing now with translation? Oh, first, first, please address the question to me, and then address the question to the PhD students. What, what do you want to do now? So, because the we, that means you, me, some colleagues, we should work on the refoundation of translation studies. I think the story, the history of translation studies, is it a success story? Yes. But it went so fast. I mean, you know, cultural terms, sociological terms, uh, a translative term, you know, I mean, so many terms for such a young discipline. I mean, one feels dizzy with all these terms, or paradigmatic shifts, or how do you call it in English? Yes, paradigm. Like, you know, yes, I mean, yes. for, for a 20 years, 30 years old mm -hmm. discipline, so many changes, you know. It's too much. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like the teenager I mean, grew up too quickly. You know? And I think we should stop and try to at least think about what are we doing? Are we working on the same 
object, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, empirical studies, uh, sociological approaches, historical approaches, philosophical takes of, you know, are we talking about saying, you know, let's, you know, just stop for one minute and refound translation studies. Uh, I think that we, we, we are now in a, in a, in a kind of crisis. Uh, trends, chapels, exclusion, exclusion on political groundings, of course, I'm referring to Mona Baker and the episode of Gideon Tui and Megan Schlesinger being exposed, being banned from this holy ground of you know, Saint Jerome publishing territory. But the situation hasn't been resolved, to my knowledge, you know. I mean, so, I mean, we are, and we know about those boundaries. Maybe, I mean, we, we're kind of discreet, but there are definite boundaries, you know, the us. That us that and so on political uh, uh, grounds, but also on epistemological or methodological grounds. You know, uh, descriptive studies on one hand and more speculative approaches on the other hand. Where could we find a common ground for dialogue? So I think yes. I mean there is a necessity for a refoundation of uh, translation studies, and we we should work on that. What would you say to people starting with? Uh, who want to do a doctorate in translation studies? What sort of things do we have to look at? I think that uh, they should take the full extent of what translation is about. Uh, it's about politics, it's about anthropology, it's about economy, it's about pragmatics, it's about uh, political activism, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's about yeah, textual transfer. But and I'm not denying the fact that it's not possible to escape this reality of the fact that translation is first and foremost a textual transfer. But this textual transfer is also the symbol of other kind of transfer, political transfer, cultural transfer, psychological transfer, even in psychoanalytic sense. And, and, and I think that the PhD students should be aware of that, of the extension of the field of uh, translation studies, not take one approach. I mean, we are very proud to say that, well, the discipline of translation studies, uh, it's an interdisciplinary field or transdisciplinary field, but when I'm looking at the PhD research topics, I'm very disappointed to see very, very narrow approaches. So instead of encouraging our students to be transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, whatever you want to call it, this kind of approach, uh, we are not, we are, we are kind of very cautious mm -hmm. and uh, I think that uh, more and more the PhD thesis are just looking like another thesis written in comparative literature or in linguistics or in sociology except that they are taking translation as an object of study or as a field of study but the methodology, the epistemology doesn't belong to the field and I think that's what we should tell uh, our students.